the human body one cell at a time. That is what the research of the human cell atlas is about. Each of you has different cell types that work together to form the tissues in your body. And each tissue has a different cell composition, as you can see here for the upper airway, the lower airway, the thymus and the heart, for example. Each of those cells contains exactly the same DNA, pretty much, to a first approximation. And yet, they look very different. They have different sizes, shapes, and, and different functions. And the reason for that is that there's an invisible machinery inside each cell that generates a different set of genes that are active in, in diverse cell types. So you can see fibroblasts on the left that are structural cells in the body and have one subset of genes, one, one transcriptome that's active in that subset that generates the proteins that determine its function, and the neuron on the right that has a, a very different subset of genes that are active that carry out neuronal functions. And so measuring that, that subset of genes in each single cell in a given tissue is a very powerful technology. And that technology is called single cell transcriptomics or single cell genomics. And it's, it's that um, single cell transcriptomics at scale that's one of the pillars of the Human Cell Atlas project because it allows us to, to see or characterize each single cell in a more comprehensive way, arguably, than with, than with a microscope. And so the, the, this resolution revolution in genomics that's happened over the past 10 years or so allows us to um, take a, a cells in suspension from a tissue, isolate the individual cells, and then um, sequence the entire um, transcriptome that's active in that cell or other layers of, of information like the epigenome or, or genome. And it's, it's the ability to do that at scale that's catalyzed the Human Cell Atlas Consortium and um, that, was, that was one of the key technologies that was at the root of this work when we started the project over five years ago now. So the mission of the Human Cell Atlas is to generate a comprehensive reference map of all the cells in our body, which we believe uh, has, has um, implications not only for a basic understanding, the cell biology of human tissues, to better understand what the cells are in our body, but also in applications in terms of diagnosing, monitoring, understanding, and treating disease. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that throughout this presentation. So the history of this project is um, rooted to some extent in, in Sanger, in the cellular genetics program. When I uh, joined in 2016, or actually before I joined, I reached out to, to Aviv, um, who was at the Broad Institute at the time, and um, we, we were both very much aligned on um, our vision to start this project, and that it was the right time five years ago, roughly, to, to kick off a larger initiative um, with the aim of mapping the human body. We organized the first meeting in London in 2016, down at the Wellcome Trust. And now, uh, now in the meantime, uh, the, the community has grown, you can see, to almost 2,000 members up here, uh, spread across the entire world. And the, very importantly, I'd like to point out the link down here. So for any scientists that are, that are listening and that are interested in joining this project, there's a link down at the bottom to invite you to join the HCA, which you can do as an individual member or as a project. Um, and and uh, you know, we, the, the emphasis on this, this community is that it's a grassroots scientific community. And for everybody else who's listening from Sanger and from the Genome Campus, I hope you just enjoy the, the talk and uh, hearing about what we're up to in, in the Human Cell Atlas Consortium. So the idea is to create a Google map of the human body. And using these high resolution technologies that I've mentioned a bit about is we want to get from the, the coarse grain view of the human body as, as the, the Earth, basically the, the anatomical view, 
down to the, the, um, the organ, if you will, and all the way down to the histological view of our cells using high throughput, high resolution, comprehensive uh, genomics technologies. A little bit more about the, the community. I've emphasized that there are, there are many, many members spread all across the world. And, and most recently, we've started uh, over the past year or, or a bit more, um, there's been an equity working group that's emphasizing equity and diversity in terms of the scientists that are involved, but also the samples that we study. And this is chaired by Alex Shalek, Partha Majumdar, and Musa Manga. The other way that our community is organized is into biological networks. So we, we also have technology working groups um, focusing on the experimental and computational technologies. And then we also have uh, um, clusters focused around particular organs or systems. And you can see the different um, organs and systems that are covered here. It's, it's getting relatively comprehensive. So the, the, um, the project has grown um, quite significantly over the last year. And I'll, what I'll come back to later in the talk is, is um, work that was kickstarted by the Lung Biological Network community. And you can see the chairs here, Pascal Barbri, Sasha Michard, Moitena Ren, and Jay Rajagopal in, in um, France the US, Holland, and, uh, yeah, and, and the US again. Um, and that, that will be to do with some of the COVID work that I'll talk about. We also have a very active and exciting development community, um, a group looking at organoids as models of human tissues, and then groups dedicated to genetic diversity. So I've mentioned single cell genomics, and you can think about this um, as a genomics technology that uh, gives us genomic information on the individual pieces of fruit that are inside the fruit smoothie um, as, as contrasted to conventional bulk genomics that basically looks at the ensemble of cells um, as an average in your smoothie. The single cell genomics gives you the selection of the chunks of fruit. But then, of course, what we'd also like to understand is the way those chunks of fruit are arranged in terms of the detailed architecture of our tissues. So how do those different cells come together to form a functioning brain, heart, thymus, lung, et cetera? And so that's really where the spatial transcriptomics technologies come in, is putting together the pieces of that cake, putting together the pieces of fruit back into that jigsaw puzzle, how they fit together. And so it's the combination of the single cell genomics and the spatial technologies that will get us to this Google Maps view of, of the tissues and, and allow us to zoom in to the three-dimensional architecture of cells and their relationships in tissues. And, and you know, having that comprehensive and high-resolution understanding is, seems incredibly exciting to me in and of itself. Um, to you, you, know, you may ask yourself, why, why does Sarah spend so much of her time unraveling the cells and their relationships, so it's a, it's a fun pastime. But what I want to emphasize in this talk is that it, that that knowledge and understanding actually has practical applications in the context of regenerative biology. So in other words, IPS-derived and organoid systems um, as models for our tissues and ultimately applications in regenerative biology, and also for uh, drilling into disease mechanisms so that we understand um, early stages of disease and what goes awry in disease relative to the healthy reference map of our, the cell atlas of our tissues. So I want to emphasize um, basically the excitement that people like me get from a basic understanding, but also how that basic understanding can translate into useful applications in biomedical, in the biomedical world. So to give you a, a snapshot of examples of where we stand in terms of the project and the data today, um, this, these are um, snippets of uh, data sets in the human cell atlas data coordination platform for different organs. So you can see the kidney up here. We've got almost a million cells from, from different samples, from many different samples and distinct individuals. The skin equally, almost a million cells. The lung, um, of course, very 
important in the COVID context, over a million cells, hundreds of samples, over 100 individual people, donors. Um, uh, the, the colon, the large intestine that you can see here, again, many samples of individuals, and then we've got the, the development community, which, which is obviously encompasses many different organs, um, and, and that's why there are uh, over 4 million single cell transcriptomes that we have information for from human embryonic and fetal development, and then the liver, finally the liver up there. So basically, um, you know, five years into the project, we're still in the early phases of data generation, but you can see it is ramping up and really gaining momentum. And we are starting to map many different tissues at, at this single cell resolution and, and gaining incredible, uh, uh, rapidly uh, uh, very new insights about the cells in our body. One of the vignettes that I'd like to drill into that's not, not on here is unpublished work um, from Cambridge, a collaboration between us at the Sanger Institute, so Rose Orvento's group, my group, Oma Barrector, and two groups down in Cambridge University, um, uh, and Margareta Turco in the pathology department, and, um, and Ashley Moffat, where we've been mapping the human uterus. And the reason that I'm so excited about that is that uh, it's a relatively understudied tissue in, in the human context because uh, it's the, the, the tissue architecture is different between the human and the mouse, so rodent models don't actually give us the, the full store in the human. Um, and of course, the, the rodent models are the ones that are accessible and have been um, studied in detail in, in many tissues. And um, the other challenge is that we have a, a dynamic tissue that changes over the monthly cycle. And so understanding that dynamics adds an additional layer of complexity beyond the three-dimensional challenge that you would have in most tissues. So it's really a four-dimensional question that we're trying to answer here is how, what is the architecture of this tissue and how does it change over the month, monthly cycle? And this is where the cell atlas technologies uh, really reveal their power because what we're able to do with um, uh, these tissue samples from deceased transplant donors working with Corsai Parsi uh, and his team in Adam Brooks Hospital and the Cambridge Clinical School is that we can get biopsies that cover the entire layer of the uterus. So that means the myometrium, which is the, the layer of muscle around the outside of the uterus, and the endometrium, which is the inside layer um, uh, lining the uterus in, in the, uh, adjacent to the lumen, the interior. And um, we, we can get these samples from, from donors that are deceased at different stages of the cycle. So Menzies um, proliferative and secretory phases, Menzies follicular and luteal phases. And these are the number of donors from each phase, four and three and so on. We can establish the phases uh, using pathology analysis um, with, with expert pathologists, Louisa Moore, uh, Leah Campos and Ashley Moffat. Um, the 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 excitement on this slide on this on this um, on this slide that you can see here are the tissue sections shown on the top right and and, and on the two left and right on the bottom uh, is that these tissue sections are uh, showing you individual transcriptomic libraries in each voxel here um, so on the on the slide that's about four millimeters by four millimeters we have individual um, libraries that are that cover a 50 micron voxel um, so there are thousands of these in the tissue section and what we can then do is interrogate that data in terms of um, what we know about the cell types from our single cell and single nuclear RNA sequencing data from the same tissue samples and and uh, define the cell populations and then figure out where the individual cell populations are sitting and so what we see here are, for instance, glandular epithelial cell markers. This is a gene that marks glandular epithelial cells. And that's high, um, basically, sort of throughout the this bottom or central layer of the endometrium. You can see the red is high gene expression. And then uh, fibroblasts, those structural cells that I mentioned originally uh, in the beginning of my talk, there's a key population that um, uh, uh, covers the top layer of the endometrium in the, the last stage of the menstrual cycle that we also see in the decidua, in other words, the pregnant version of the endometrium, after implantation of the, the placenta takes place, which we showed two years ago in a paper on the placenta and the decidua. 
In contrast, there's a separate distinct type of fibroblast that sits in the basal layer of the endometrium, which we can see here. And uh, there's a distinct type of epithelial cells that are ciliated that we can see in the top luminal layer lining the inside that we can see nicely um, defining the top layer of the endometrium, uh, these wrinkles along the top. And we see an, uh, an interesting LGR5 population, which we think is a cycling progenitor population of cells, uh, also positioned specifically along the lining of the endometrium, the top in the lumen. So the reason that I, I'm emphasizing these two different types of cells is the, the fibroblast cells are thought of as structural cells. What we show is that they secrete key signals to the epithelial cells, the glandular and the ciliated cells, these two different populations that we're showing here, and form the, the, the microenvironment that instructs those cells to differentiate during every monthly cycle. So basically the fibroblast that I mentioned is structural cells, they turn out to be distinct in different layers of the endometrium. We show here the zonated architecture with these distinct layers of fibroblasts that define the, the zones uh, of the endometrium. And it's those structural cells that we predict are sending signals to the epithelial cells to tell them to go down different um, cell fates every month. And um, so what I showed you there are spatial transcriptomics data and spatial transcriptomics tissue sections. We can also analyze tissue sections using imaging, using microscopy um, and, um, and single molecule uh, fish. And so this is work from uh, Kenny, Byracto, uh, Kenny Roberts and Omar, By Omar Byracto's group analyzing tissue sections that are taken from different stages of the cycle for, for different sets of markers. The epithelial cells are marked with EPCAM in blue here, and you can see the secretory epithelial cells marked by PAEP in this green um, image in, in the third, in the third uh, row, in these green, in the green images. And what this shows is that these particular secretory epithelial cells form glands um, that basically become mm, uh, larger and more distinct during the secretory phase and then shrivel sort of by the late secretory phase. Um, and, um, and, and these beautiful images show how that's a subset of epithelial cells with, with MMP7 positive cells forming a, a different subset. You can see here these MMP7 positive cells lining the lumen of the endometrium at the end of the cycle and in a very specific manner. So, and th so these beautiful microscopy images uh, um, uh, give us a different angle and a different resolution of, of um, um, insight into the tissue architecture in parallel with the sequencing data. So this in vivo atlas of the human uterus, you know, it's very beautiful, extremely exciting for us to gain this knowledge. And um, how does it actually inform us about, um, you know, uh, uh, diseases like endometriosis, endometrial cancer, and how can we use it to, um, uh, um, in, in terms of diseases, engineering tissues, and so on? Well, one, one application is that we can use the information from the in vivo cell atlas to engineer um, cells and, and organoids, sort of organs in a dish, a uterus in a dish, essentially. And um, the way I view all the human cell atlas data is that it's providing us with the recipe for making tissues in vitro. And more specifically, the way I think about it is that the in vivo data tells us what the transcription factors are that are expressed in each cell type. So those are the regulators that switch on modules of genes and activate them. What are the, um, the secreted ligands that, that are sending signals to cells in their microenvironment? Um, and how and, and really those are those are the kinds of key key regulators that we need to understand to replicate uh, the tissue in a dish. And so the the, the endometrium in a dish system has been established by Marguerite Turco and the University of Cambridge uh, several years ago now, and um, coming using the signals that we predict to be secreted from the fibroblasts that are adjacent to the glands and the fibroblasts that are adjacent to the ciliated cells, we could modify an engineered culture condition 
that made those two different subtypes of endometrial cells. So we're able to kind of precision engineer the organoid and um, uh, in that way also confirm the predictions from the in vivo cell atlas about how the cells are talking to each other and how the cells are influencing each other to form the tissue architecture of the, of the uterus. So in that way, um, you know, the human, we, we've shown, and, and there are many other examples from other people, uh, how the human cell atlas uh, can, is directly having a direct impact on the field of uh, model systems in a dish and regenerative biology making human tissues in a dish. And um, what I want to go on to next is give you an example of how the human cell atlas is providing insights into the disease mechanism. So the top right here. So um, going back a year or so, we published a paper on um, uh, contrasting data from healthy reference bronchoscopy samples from the bronchi of, of healthy donors as compared to asthmatic donors, asthmatic patients, as well as uh, alveoli. Um, from deceased transplant donor tissue. And we published this last year in Nature Medicine, and that gave us insight into the structure of the bronchi, which forms this epithelial monolayer with immune cells and, and stromal cells peppered in, that you can see here, and the alveoli, um, which contain these large alveolar type 2 cells um, and, um, and um, uh, alveolar type 1 cells among the the, the vessels and immune cells. So um, yeah, asthma, as I'm sure you all know, is a condition where um, the, the, there's an inflammation that leads to thickening of the, the airway walls and then the asthmatic attack. So at, at a cellular molecular level, what's the difference between uh, bronchoscopy samples from healthy versus deceased donors? And we, we sought out to answer, to answer this question using the precision technology of single cell genomics. And what we, what we discovered in, throughout that work was changes in different cell compartments, both the, the epithelial cells, the functional cells in the lung, as well as immune cell compartments. And um, um, uh, during this work, we, uh, I should say that we also studied um, the upper airways, in other words, the nasal epithelium, uh, the bronchi and the parenchyma, so from top to bottom of the, uh, of the airways. And one of the things that we saw in the um, nasal cavity was uh, a subset of epithelial cells or goblet cells, um, so there's functional cells inside the nose that have a particular phenotype um, where they have a particular immune phenotype where they are secreting signals and talking to other cells of the immune systems, T cells, dendritic cells, and so on, as compared to a more sort of quiescent. Um, a sep distinct population of goblets and ciliated cells that are shown here in the nasal epithelium. And what, what we saw later was that those um, cells in the nose express ACE2, which of course, you know, starting at the beginning of this year, uh, is a gene that's become very uh, prominent, let's say, not for its enzymatic activity, but for its role it sort of happenstance role as the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And um, so I want to use this to illustrate one of the ways that the healthy reference data can inform us about disease. And that is basically to map where the, the receptor and the protease, so ACE2 and TIMPRAS2, uh, for the coronavirus, for the SARS-CoV-2, are expressed around the tissues of our body. Um, and this was a work that was basically became a, a consortium effort, um, started off with the, the lung biological network collaborators. Um, so that particular community, because the airways, of course, are so important in the, the, um, the pathology of this disease. But then it really became a broader effort of the, the broader human cell atlas community. And what was incredibly um, basically amazing about this effort was how fast people contributed data towards understanding the SARS-CoV-2 receptor expression. And so this included uh, unpublished data from the eye, unpublished data from the heart, the liver, and these are um, really groups from around the world that contributed this. 
in this very open and very rapid way. And so we published this work earlier this year um, as a community paper. And um, I, I'll walk you through a, a few of the key barrier tissues um, that, that we think are particularly interesting in this context, because of course the human cell atlas data, what we're looking at here is mostly healthy reference data. It's not the infected tissue, which I'll come on to later. And so looking at the healthy reference data, I think where this is particularly informative is providing predictions about where the virus might be entering the healthy cells at the very early phase of infection. And so I've mentioned the nose earlier and, and these goblet cells uh, that are particularly high in the receptor, that's why they're dark blue. If we look at the lungs uh, in the, the bronchi, the lower airway, then they are both club and ciliated cells that express the two key proteins. If we look deep down in the lung in the parenchyma, the alveoli, then we see these alveolar type 2 cells, which were described already 16 years ago as expressing ACE2, which is the coronavirus receptor using immunohistochemistry. Um, now in the eye, and this was data from Linda Lake on Manchester that she shared uh, very, very quickly, what, what amazed us was that we see um, expression in cells of the conjunctiva and the cornea. And so this um, implicates the nasolacrimal duct, so the, the connection between the eye and the nose as potentially involved in early infection and transmission. In the gut, we see in the, in the small intestine enterocytes um, that express the receptor. And of course, there are gastrointestinal features of the disease. And in the placenta, so this harks back to the endometrium that I talked about earlier. This is the maternal fetal interface and the, the, uh, the, the deciduum and the placenta, the uterus and the placenta. We see um, uh, expression in um, trophoblast cells of the placenta as well as decidual cells on the maternal side, so both on the fetal and the maternal side. And this suggests that there can be potential maternal fetal transition of the virus, but of course we know from clinically that this is a if it, if it happens, it's a very rare event indeed. So we, uh, in, a, in, a, in a mammoth kind of effort, um, collating data from around the world, uh, Wardon Songnak, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, and, and Ni Huang, um, a, a computational scientist in the lab, worked fantastically with the consortium and with, with brilliant support from the Cell Gen IT team, kind of really playing to the strengths of the uh, the technical teams, the support teams in Sangha, who are just amazing. And just let me say thank you to, to everybody on the campus who works in a role like that. Uh, you know, these, many of these teams are absolutely amazing in their level, their quality, and their dedication. And what we were able to do was to put together this uh, COVID-19 cell atlas for the community. Now, of course, all of that data that I've referred to so far is healthy reference human cell atlas data. And um, um, what, what that healthy reference data provides is a hypothesis about where the virus could be entering. In order to, to understand more about what, what, what happens during the disease, what we really want is patient samples, patient data. And um, looking at interior tissues is mostly um, only feasible using uh, samples from deceased patients um, who've died of COVID-19. And um, we're very lucky in the UK to have a, a mortuary at Westminster that allows pathology uh, specimen collection. And so this is from Michael Osborne, Brian Hanley at Imperial, together with Michaela Maceda, um, and also uh, an effort in Newcastle that's available, uh, where, where tissue samples are collected from deceased COVID-19 patients. And then again, Kenny and Omar have looked at uh, have, have, have analyzed this tissue using their multiplex fish approach and also the new nanostring GOMX uh, uh, instrument. And so um, what you're seeing here is a lung sample and, an, and um, a section where there's SARS-CoV-2 um, probes that are lighting up in green and AT2 cells, which are those alveolar type 2 cells that I mentioned earlier and white. You can see them peppered around. And... Um, what, what this histogram shows is that there are very variable loads in, in virus in different donors. So there's a lot of donor to donor variability. 
Um, if we zoom into different regions from the same donor, uh, here in, in, in white and in yellow, there are some regions that have a low viral load and a lot of AT2 cells, and then other regions that have a much higher viral load. The virus, again, is in green, and many fewer AT2 cells. The AT2 cells are in white, so presumably because they are dying of infection and, and disappearing. Uh, and, and, and this is where the damage really, um, uh, where you can see the damage at the molecular and cellular level happening. A much broader, uh, Omar and, and Michaela together, their groups um, with, with, with collaborating with all of us are doing a much broader survey of different tissues. And of course, the kidney, the heart, and the vasculature have been um, implicated in um, the pathology of COVID-19. And you can see here uh, uh, steps at interrogating um, what's going on in these tissues add a lot of detail. So CDH5 is a marker of, of endothelial cells, so blood vessels, and um, you can see that the, the changes in, or, or what basically structures across different tissues, nose, pharynx, heart, uh, kidney, and so on. Um, and this is, this is very early work. I should say this is um, an ongoing effort, and uh, there are similar pathology uh, uh, collections available in the U.S. and in Italy that we're aware of, and we're coordinating across this community um, using the infrastructure and the, the human cellulose community and also the Allied Lifetime Consortium uh, for study of disease tissues in Europe. And so with those, uh, those two stories on a regenerative biology and the uterus in a dish and the disease mechanistic work on COVID-19, as, as well as asthma, um, I hope I've told you, I've given you some insights into what we're up to in the human cellulose community and how it can actually be useful. Uh, and um, the tissues I've talked about are, again, just to remind you, the uterus, um, the maternal fetal interface, and, and uh, um, detail on the airways to some extent. Thank you, uh, everybody, for listening, both on the Welcome Genome Campus and anywhere else that you may be and uh, I'm happy to take questions.